What does it mean? What does it, does mean, it mean to what mean it mean? to be 2020 MotoGP champion? Right. Welcome to Breda GP. Welcome to episode number 141, a secret recording where we're not going live because we're changing it up. The topic at hand is what does it mean to be the 2020 MotoGP champion? Obviously, this entire year has been batshit. Oh, I shouldn't have swore in the first five seconds of the video. That was probably Yeah, bad. you're fired, Rob. You're fired. Totally fired. Um, Deplatform- deplatformed. <laughs> <laughs> Things have been crazy. We may actually come across a year in MotoGP where the championship winner does not win a race. But before we get there, I have two announcements. The first one is that this amazing shirt that's in the middle of my video, the <laughs> Doc Man, and the amazing shirt that Kev is wearing right below me, has shipped. Every single one that has been ordered has shipped out. It is uh, Wednesday, October 28th. They shipped two days ago on Monday, so a bunch of people have probably already received them. If you didn't get a tracking number in your email and you'd like one, just email me at bredgp.tho at gmail.com and I'll get it to you. But I think most people got it. Um, they should be coming soon. Second thing, of course, this podcast is brought to you by Riders Law. Riders Law, they are California motorcycle and accident injury lawyers. If you are in need of legal help because you got into an accident on your motorcycle, someone maybe caused some injuries to you and you need some legal help in the courtroom, some legal representation, please give Riders Law a call. That's R-I-D-E-R-Z-L-A-W.com. I'm sorry, Kev that we didn't do one of your amazing segues for the writer's law segment. It's okay. <laughs> yeah. That alone would have been taken up like 30 minutes. Right. The, the build, the build up to the segue would have taken up quite a long time. The 2020 championship is already nuts. Uh, we've got Alex Rins leading the way at the, Oh God, Alex Rins. Sorry. We have Sean Muir leading the way. Freud and um, over there. I don't think that was really a Freudian sleep. That was just me being a dumbass. All right, Dennis, take it away. What do we got going on here? I've been meaning to share this with Kevin, actually. But so mm-hmm. one of the things that I learned during quarantine, right, the new skill, I yes. learned how to carve up and cut a pineapple. Okay. Well, every time I do, I swear to God, Kevin, I'm thinking of you. Mm. I'm whispering to that pineapple while I'm peeling it, <laughs> cutting the eyes out. You're whispering sweet nothings? I was whispering to it. This is for my friend, you attempted murdering motherfucker. Yes, exactly. Each and every one of them. <laughs> what you're saying is Dennis is like the Dexter of pineapples. Uh-huh. The Dexter of fruit, I should mm-hmm. say, which is that he only cuts up fruit in a sanitary kill room environment. Guilty fruit. Fruit yeah. that's guilty of a crime. And that's how Dennis keeps himself from becoming a psychopath. That's funny because I actually do wear like a pink Miami shirt whenever I'm cutting a pineapple. Right. <laughs> I'm the fruity Dexter, basically. Nice. If you guys, If you guys missed it, it was like, what five episodes ago that kevin regaled us with his story about how pineapple tried to commit murder on him correct yeah attempted murder was committed there was absolutely (laughs) attempted murder i am consuming the soul of every pineapple that has attempted to kill you kevin here we are wednesday night and if you're hearing me talk just now for the first time it's because rob cut and edited out eight minutes of nonsense before this episode started (laughs) might happen so here I am. It's Wednesday. It's evening, and the race just happened, and we have a little bit of a lull before the sort of final push to the season, and we are looking down the very plausible, distinct possibility that the 2020 MotoGP World Champion will not have won a race. Previously, I mentioned Joan Mir is leading the championship. He is clearly the most consistent rider on the grid. Now that he's leading the championship, we can say that technically. That is technically correct, which, again, is the best kind of correct. Um, (laughs) Fabio has faltered enough, even though he has uh, multiple wins, that he has lost his title lead and has uh, continued to give up points to Joan Mir uh, for two rounds now. Meanwhile, while Mir is the most consistent rider in terms of podium and top five finishes lately, we do see that other riders – namely Renz Morbidelli, seem to have an edge on him, an outright race-winning pace. And so what we're seeing, and you see this as the kind of meta that's going around the internet journalism, it's the first time in a long time that the coverage, the journalists actually are covering the correct topic was, what does it mean if you have a MotoGP champion win the premier class title without winning a race or that possibility? If we look back to other seasons that had 
a, a low point scoring, very few winners. We look at like Nikki Hayden as a class example. For Mir, right, 2006, for Mir to have more wins than Hayden's sort of legendary season, he has to win a hat trick. He's got to win the next three if they even happen because we're also looking at big, massive rising COVID numbers in Western Europe. You're seeing France is locking back down again. Spain is locking down relatively extremely in certain areas. Um, Dorna has put out uh, a press release basically telling the teams – fuck around and find out because we'll get canceled so we also look at the possibility and again i think a distinct possibility that we could have a winner in moto gp that has not won a race and a winner who was winner by default because rounds are canceled and mathematic it changes the mathematics of it through all of the craziness in 2020 we have to look at what it even means to have to become MotoGP world champion in 2020. What does that mean in the grand scheme of championships? Where does that place the value of this championship compared to other championships? And before this uh, recording started, we, me and Dennis talked a bunch about other kind of previously um, famous years. And I think there's two really famous seasons for – what we would call surprise winners that carry weight and sort of legendary status. And they're two totally different ones. And the first one I want to mention is going to be obviously Dennis's favorite season. Uh, and the season that really cemented him as a fan. And that's Casey Stoner's two, surprise 2007 total domination of the series. I didn't In- expect you to bring that one up. Because the reason why I'm, I'm saying, what does it mean to be the champion this year is this is going to go down Obviously, this is a defining moment for many of our lives, the, med- the, the, the zeitgeist of the world, right? Like, this is going to be obviously a year that we all remember, a year that has, like, 2020. It'll be like a meme eventually, and it'll be a reference to, like, you know, in, like, 2050. It'll be like, fuck, this pizza tastes like 2020, right? And it's because it has pineapples on it and try to fucking murder people. Um, what the 2020? I have I have a thought on what it means for if if Mir to win the title without winning or whoever wins the title to win it with very minimal races. But I wanted to first talk about Stoner winning the championship in 2007 and why it was so memorable. Not just because he won a lot of races. I noticed I censored myself there because Rob already swore too much at the beginning of the episodes. So now I got to bring it back. I got to be the responsible one. Thanks, Kev. Um, but Dennis, obviously stoners, that's a memorable season for you, but what is particularly memorable about that season? A guy, as a guy who, who, if you look on the, if you're watching the video feed directly behind him off to his right is literally a picture of aforementioned champion. Well, I should correct you a little bit. I mean, you're not wrong that it's a favorite season per se, but I, it wasn't, I wasn't watching it. You know, I don't know if you recall this. I didn't actually start following MotoGP until 2000. I mean, 2008. My story is right? based on true events. Just right. No, but but the reason you're still <laughs> the reason you're still correct is because it's only it's after the fact after we learned Stoner and what he had to deal with. In the, I know it was the first year in Ducati, but that bike, despite things going right for it, it wasn't really that great. Like he, he right. probably was the only rider that could win the championship in 2007 on Ducati, and I think the reason why I I like Ducati on, I mean, Stoner on Ducati more than I like Ducati. I mean, Stoner on Honda is because I've said it before. Stoner was winning on a Ducati. It was like winning a gunfight with a knife. And this is my point. Yeah. Stoner's 2007 championship is not memorable because of the domination. It's memorable, especially in 2020 hindsight. Dad, <laughs> it's memorable. You're so ready to be a dad, bro. So ready to be a dad. Uh, it's memorable because of what he overcame, not what he did specifically, but the contextual the, by contextualizing yeah. what he did and what he overcame. Ah, twenty twenty is twenty twenty is far more memorable than Valentino Rossi, or excuse me, two, uh, his um, Case Owners two thousand seven championship is far more memorable than Valentino's two thousand five championship where he won a grip of races and was basically never off the podium because it was expected. No one ever even talks about 2005. The only thing we don't even talk about when he rammed Sete off the ra- off the race, uh, the last corner in the first race, like 2005 is like a non-event, even though he clearly dem- decimated, right? Casey Stoner's, even though it's a dominating season where he was clearly a class above everyone else, that's not what we talk about. 
13, 14, 15 years on, 20 years on. We talk about the fact that he did it on a Ducati. We talk about the fact that Dennis made that cool. He, he's made, you know, Photoshop some cool stuff where it's like where a guy brought a knife to a gunfight and won. And won. Stoner won when he never should have. Stoner won against odds that were so unbelievably stacked that it's insane that he did it. I, I actually thought that you were going to go the other way with the 2007 comparison because it was memorable in the beginning, like right at Valencia 2007, because it was Ducati, because he got on this bike that that uh, wasn't a, kind of wasn't really a title challenger since actually, I mean, Loris Caparossi was leading the title in 2006. So that's not even valid to say. It's just he then he then took the. Uh, he took the Ducati and took that next step for it and was so dominating on it. And like, I feel like at the end of 2007, we are going to put an asterisk on the whole year of like, Oh, he only won because the Ducati. He only won because traction control, right? Like that was the big, yeah, because, because Honda shit the bed with the, with front end feel on the bike they designed for Danny Pedrosa. And because of the the (laughs) spirit of the rules, right? Like Honda was like, remember it had like almost no body work because it was all, it was supposed to be all about, transition right so like yeah. their aerodynamics they totally just completely missed the mark in 2007 and the yamaha right we always remember that like the famous guitar in shanghai um like helicopter shots where stoner is just mugging him down the straightaway right and that became mm-hmm. the whole meta at first was he's only winning cuts which is of course <clears throat> what we initially said about people and guys doing well and was the sort of initial thought process for 2020 he's only winning he being whoever we're talking about because there's no marquez he's Uh only champion because there's no tip of the point repsol rider right he's only winning because which of course we find out later really is going to be coming out just like we'll find out this is obviously false just like we found out that you know, Marco Melandri rides the 2008 Ducati. He can't ride it at all. Valentino gets on it. He can't do it. Casey Stoner, who was a, or excuse me, Nikki wow. Hayden, who was the previous champion, can barely do anything on it. Obviously, while not the greatest ever, he was no slouch. Loris Caprossi goes from title challenger, uh, and t- uh, if it wasn't for that Catalonia crash, to almost nowhere. He only wins at Motegi in the rain. He disappears, right? Yet, for some mm. reason, the whole story of 2007 was that Stoner won because the ducati so they were putting a qualifier or a quantifier i should say on his title victory which has since then been obviously completely wiped so for me when we look at 2020 if we're going to use history to give us a lens to look at the current events we have to know that the talk about no marquez and no you know repsol a writer that is not a quantifier that's a quantifier people tried to say to diminish accomplishments but that's going to come out to not be the quantifier there's no marquez because of his own fault we've already talked about this but we've seen it mir and fabio and morbidelli and rins their average overall finish is very low if marquez had just not tried to come back he'd probably already be champion oh right? yeah because, right like he, that right, that twelve and a half points per round at this point and marquez's right. average for the previous seasons was probably higher than 20 in some cases so I think we have to use 2007 and Casey Stoner to know and to use that lens to say that, that is Marquez being gone is the same kind of quantifier that people tried to say, oh, you're only winning because traction control. You're only winning because Ducati. You're only winning because Ducati didn't conform to the spirit of the rules. Did you Not- did you set me up, Kev, knowing that I was going to bring up the asterisks of 2007 and the Ducati? I feel no, like, I feel I, like I you knew I was going to do it. <laughs> quick. Um, but that leads me to another incredibly memorable season that in many cases people felt while not quite asterixy in its, in its, it's uh, it has its own name. And that was previous to that year, Nikki Hayden, 2006 world champion, um, you know, RIP, obviously Nikki, you know, we all miss every, miss him. Um, and who, who has a style of winning the championship that we've become to be affectionately known on the forums and the boards and on Facebook as he's going to hate in his way to the title, which is basically like code for he's just going to hang in there. 
he's going to do what he can and he's it's going to work itself out right he's going to sylvain ginto lee sort of to, to go world to right style which will get Nikki Hayden, <laughs> at the time and i believe is still the case had the lowest total points for a world champion he only won two races you could even say he only won Assen because colin just ate shit at the end of it he only won because valentino had constant uh he had like tires delaminating a couple of times which never mm-hmm. happens right like literally happens. issues uh i remember a few times and then yeah the famous crash in the last round of course yeah nikki hayden course. only scored 14.8 points around so compared to other championship winning seasons like we've already brought up with marquez and and valentino and even stoner right that's quite a low total 252 points over 17 rounds Right. So now what we're seeing is potentially even less points than that, although less rounds, but less points and potentially even less wins for a champion. Twelve and a half points per round right now for Mir. Brutal. Brutal. Right. And the ch- I, and raising that average is going to be real hard because he doesn't seem to be showing the kind of – and he no, – Knowing how we predict, he could go win three races straight, right? And just make this whole <laughs> episode a moot point. But that doesn't matter because this episode's hella relevant for at least a month. Um, <laughs> right. Uh, which this is, is a why time decided, capsule. Right. We decided not to just talk about Takanakagami like yeah. eating shit on like the third corner no. because like. We'll talk about that in a proper episode. Right. You know, yeah. But for me, I guess we're looking at the final stretch and. When and, and other things like Sidney Hayden right getting taken out by by uh, Danny Damn. Pedrosa, famous season. But one thing I really, when I was thinking about this episode and thinking about the season, is when people talk about like he hated his way to a championship or he is the lowest point score. But in the last twenty years, or at least in the modern era, you could go farther than that too, and uh, all the way back to Wayne Rainey. What's like literally the most talked about season? 2006 what's like the most legendary season 2006 it's the most memorable season and i'm not saying this as like an american here i'm talking it's literally just the most talked about because it's the craziest season Mm -hmm. like and like it's the most talked about legendary season of at least i mean look we have talked before this valentino uh, got his bridgestone tires in 2008 and won the title Right after like all the shit talking, no one ever talks about that. No one ever talks about <laughs> 2009. People don't even remember that Jorge Lorenzo like won races. We literally just talk about his scarves. We literally <laughs> just talk about how, how how he's skinny fat. No one even remembers that Jorge Lorenzo literally beat Valentino Rossi, Casey Stoner, and Mark Marquez straight up because there's nothing very. Those seasons just don't seem to hold weight. They don't seem to to stick in your brain to have memory. Like they're not that song that pops up on the radio or Spotify that just brings you back somewhere. You know what I mean? They're not like the smell of some food that just gives you all the memories. But 2006, Nikki Hayden, all of those things. You can just. You, I, I can remember every fucking race. I can remember every bike on the grid. Right, I don't even know who was on like the Tech Three in two thousand eight. I have no idea, right? But I know that like in were they on Dunlops or they were Dun- Dun- no, that was two thousand six when they were on the Dunlops. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like what was going on? You know? And it's like it, that was just such a legendary season. I guess what I'm getting at is is that season less valid when in the grand scheme of things it's the most talked about season in decades it's the most talked about season for a huge portion of the world like it's the most legendary season and i think we're and why is it legendary because the guy who wasn't supposed to win it put his head down worked hard good old boy from kentucky never said a bad word about nobody you know what i mean like almost like too nice to a fault you know what i mean like too genuine you know what yeah, i mean like until well, he had to put you up against the wall because your name's biagi right yeah exactly <laughs> right and it's like and and yet that's the most famous one and all i'm seeing is these parallels of whoever in 2020 wins the championship is just the guy who didn't fuck up and isn't that a classic like in 2020 it's not really about like how, what are the best highs you can get, right? The stock market, huge highs, but then the stock market has just dropped like 800 points fucking for the last two days each day, right? It's not about how good it can be. It's kind of about how not bad it can be. It's just fucking tread water and get to the other side. You know what I mean? Like just – we a lot of people in racing say that all the time, right? You don't uh, you don't win the championship on your best days. You win it on the worst days, and 
it like that's that's exactly how Mark has won his championships, right? Like his worst days, he was still second, right? But the then then there's some middle ground where that might not apply. But then now in 2020, it absolutely applies again because we're seeing riders like Fabio and Davizioso finish outside the points or 13th, 18th, or whatever, mm-hmm. right? And those are the kind of performances that are taking the title away from them. Yamaha, right? They got six wins in 11 races, right? They got three different riders winning. They're the only bike to have multiple wins with a rider, and two of the riders have done it. Yet, they've blown their engines. They've finished 13th. They've blown Mm -hmm. another engine, right? Like, they or or they just, their tire pressure is just mysterious. They don't even know what's going on. So, it doesn't (laughs) matter the fact that they're clearly the best bike on the grid. Like from a statistical and a, and a results point of view, they're also like the worst because they're just fucking up. It's not like Jack Miller where he's sucking in tear offs or, or 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 Brad Bender is just fucking packing into his ass. You know what I mean? Title of Rob Sex Tape. Uh, <laughs> like, right? Which that's not Miller's fault. Miller's lows are are not really self inflicted in Premac, but Yamaha's woes are self inflicted. For all the good they're doing, they're still fucking up. I'm still going to argue that it, the, the M1 is not the best bike in the grid. It's just that Yamaha has the best riders, whereas Suzuki has the best bike right now. The Suzuki is just the least <laughs> – in my opinion, the Suzuki has the least shitty qualities. It's the it, it's B plus at just about everything. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, which is a great way to Nikki Hayden your way to a title. Absolutely. Right. <laughs> it's what you need in 2020. All right. When the when the highs are highs and the lows are too low, you need that tool, that medium that will allow you to be average. I'm I'm gonna go ahead, since we're approaching 30 minutes here, and I'm actually going to give an answer to the entire premise of this episode. I'm gonna say that this championship is actually worth more than all of the previous ones that we're never gonna talk about again. I had to I had to look up the year that we got Dovi on Cloud Nine. Mm-hmm. It was 2016. 2016. Yeah, and I because I, I forgot the year, right? right? And and to me that just shows me that yeah, it was an amazing year. A bunch of people won, but it was still less memorable than 20. This 2020 is going to be. And if right. I'm like, I kind of, I kind of do this thing with motorcycle racing because, especially being in America, um, we're constantly looking for ways to make motorcycle racing more mainstream, and and even talking about like what's good for the sport, like things that are good for the sport, in my opinion, are things that attract fans and get more people to enjoy the thing that I'm obviously obsessed about. And 2020 is absolutely going to do that more so than 2016 did. More people are watching, right? We're seeing like, I mean, even with COVID, people staying at home, having to stream things on the television. Amazon is selling a, a butt ton of TVs so that you can you can watch these races from your house. I'm sure Dorna um, had a lot of customers for their streaming service because this season has been crazy. People are going to watch it. There are going to be plenty of fans coming out of this. And even next year, they'll bleed over into next year because everyone's still going to wonder, too, about Marquez and what the the talent and the skill level that the riders that have won races this year and someone a new, new champion is going to win it, uh, what they're going to be able to do even next year. And, and that, I was kind of leading you to that. That was my whole thesis was it means more than any of the previous years because – Oh, Whoa. sorry. That's the alarm indicating 30 minutes. Nice. Uh, <laughs> it means more because in the hardest year to do anything, that dude did the greatest thing. In the hardest year in the world to succeed, the hardest year to to rise above and handle, the hardest year, the most background noise of just stress, right? The most like just inherent stress on everyone, that guy achieved the greatest absolute thing you can do in motorcycle racing, and I would say racing, right? So inherently, the actual quantifier for this is – Whoever wins the championship, if they win no races, is still, to me, potentially the most meaningful championship that I've seen since I started watching, since 1998. And that is because this person has achieved the greatest single success you can achieve in the single hardest year to ever do it. That's a really good way to put it because even the guy that we thought was going to dominate and goat his way to another title failed. This failed year. spectacularly failed spectacularly right 
Yeah. And then look what happens when the guy who's come up just short of him three separate times finally had his shot. Failed spectacularly. <laughs> oh, spectacularly. Gonna, bringing that up is going right? to make me cry. That's, uh, that's, that's right? the code that Mir cracked is he realized you don't want to be close to the front because then you're going to fail spectacularly. So he's kind of mm-hmm. keeping his distance from the win. Because that's not going to make you win the title. So I think he cracked the code. That's a joke, by the way. Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, you know, like Homer Simpson said, the lesson is never try. Uh, just show up and re- no. But he, the I think for me, what it means to be the champion in MotoGP in 2020, despite the fact that we have almost no international racing outside of Western, outside of Europe, right? So people, is it a world championship? Well. We still have riders from all over the world, even though the races aren't taking place all over the world. Uh, we have less races. We have kind of these back-to-back races. We have no reigning champion. All of these things coming in to play. In the end, I think that whoever wins it, even if it's Mir with no wins, it's the most impressive championship win all have ever seen. I, I think that it's easy to to discount, so to speak, the championship if he does win it without a win because we're so used to people winning the championship by winning races. But it was never a requirement to win a championship. The point of winning it was to just simply score the most points at the end of the season, however that's going to be. So for me, if the question is, like, what does it mean for you to have a championship where the championship winner doesn't win a race, I've, I've already made my peace with it. Uh, and part of it is because I've looked at the 2020 as a championship that's Yes, it's one off. We said this about 2016, but we're definitely not going to have another championship like this one. Um, there's never been one before. There's never going to be another one after 2020. But I had to, I had to kind of classify this year's championship in a different way. And and the way that I I did that is um, I look at it as like an endurance championship. You know, it's not necessarily about like being the fastest or winning. You have to survive. You have to endure this kind of like condensed. Uh, contest in time and 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 you know what it what it needs and just get through it as best as you can. So for me, this is basically MotoGP's very first, if not only, endurance world championship. That's how I cope with 2020 championship. I mean, to to talk about the points, like I really I really like the point scale that MotoGP uses because it it favors winning in in ways that we've seen before, right? Because obviously you can just win half the races and take the title but it also it still gives enough points to second in their place to and and further down to allow a championship to happen like this right to it's allow progressive enough yeah. to wait towards wins but not so conservative that you can get like ama style remember the ama point system like you got a point for poll for most laps led yep. it was real like well, like it, it Supercross was progress- is Supercross, the gap between first and second is three, I believe, and then two between the next like four racers, and then one down to fifteenth or twentieth. And not progressive enough because you can, everyone can uh, can Nikki Hayden their way to the championship, and it, it doesn't really get people to try much harder for those wins. And then the flip side is the championship that shall not be named, which has a gap of like, what is it? Eight points between first and second and only pays out points to 10th. They're like too progressive. I really, yeah, I really like the way that uh, the FIM does it. But actually, Kev, I wanted to go back a little bit to one point that you were bringing up, uh, the world championship. I personally, I would never put an asterisk next to the fact that we've not gone to other continents because I feel like the world title is not location. It's talent level personnel. Yeah, exactly. It's yeah, it's talent level in the racers, talent level in the the staff, the teams that everyone putting on the races. It's everything about the championship is one step above national racing And and one step above the B series international racing, you know, one step yeah. above world Superbike and the actual world endurance championship. It's the tip of the, you know, it's the, the tip of the mountain. 
Yeah, and and there we've that in no way has been diminished by the fact that we haven't gone to other continents. And, and that's a good that a point is like that is the response to the asterisk of well, the only race in Europe. Yeah, but we had a South African winner, we had a French winner, we had a Brazilian slash Italian winner, we had a Portuguese winner, mm-hmm. we've had Spanish winners, we've had an Italian winner, right? Like the number of like we yeah, could it was still never, it was never about the nations that the series went to it's the number of nations competing in the championship correct exactly right the number of nations and not just competing like and my point is even further not just competing but like because that like you could say like oh you know carl and not just competing but succeeding like i said we had portuguese winners we have south african winners we have a french multi-time winner we've got a guy who's who, who's winning who's half brazilian, brazilian like there's yeah. Right there, we are not just that there's some people on the grid, but that these people are successful and at the end the best they could be. Like they're they're doing so well. And yeah, I mean, if, if, if anything, 2020 has been the most like <laughs> multinational world championship ever. In terms of winners, it's diversity. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. Well, yeah, and Kev, you've put a lot of stock into that before of like, hey, you, this guy is now the first person from his country to do this thing. Yep, right. Right. We've seen that from uh, from Top Rack, right? Obviously, Oliveira. Like, there Say his last of, name. Say it. Raz Gatlioglu. Yeah, there we go. You got to get that other. the only guy that could do that. I think the first L is silent, but okay. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> No, I don't know. I, I got to go find a, a Turkish person and ask him. No, the announcers finally started saying the second L, too. In a year when the international scene elevated itself, right, someone is going to be the champion of the year. When, when, when Marquez dropped out of the race, multiple nationalities and teams elevated their game. They, they seized the moment. It wasn't just like Dovi didn't just run away with it, right? Maverick just didn't just run away with it. We saw these riders who were primed and ready but hadn't taken that step take that step. So whoever wins this championship is going to be the guy who won the championship when everyone elevated their game. I mean, except for Rossi, who basically did not elevate his game, to put it nicely. <laughs> oh, you're going to make me cry again. Terrible. Speaking of Rossi... And to round the episode out, uh, see this amazing shirt that I'm wearing, and it's directly behind Rob's head. Uh, we do have some extras, and those ec- we did order a slight stock of extras, and they will be on the store shortly. It's first come, first serve at BurrowGP. What is it? Dot dot shop. Com. Dot com. Yeah, okay. No shop uh, necessary. Oh, no shop necessary. It's there, right? You just there's things to buy, store or whatever. Rob will have a click. I, it's the fucking <laughs> internet. It out. Um, <laughs> there'll be some stock of the extra shirts we ordered. So if you didn't get one during the pre-order and you're you were really wanting one, or you're seeing it live and in living color now, and on all the stories I'm sharing, people that bought it, there are a few on there. Uh, unless you are my Croatian homeboy, the rest of them are first are first come first serve. But you, uh, bro, just message me uh, when you hear this, and we'll get you lined up. Yeah, they're uh, going on the store Thursday, October 29th, in the morning, whenever I get up. So there's Pacific, Pacific there's 20, Standard Time. Pacific Standard Time. I believe there's 29 left. Mm. Yeah. There oh, you go. No, J- just enough to bail out of Yanoni. There's, yeah, barely. <laughs> there's actually less than that because I got to save some just in case things go wrong. There's less. Mm. Uh, and right. as, uh, as Kev has told you many times before with our shirts, with these cool designs, we don't print them again. We should probably no, come up with an uncool. We, we need to come up with an uncool design that we have no problem reprinting, because <laughs> we only yeah, like right. make the cool ones like limited edition. <laughs> uh, all right, closing thoughts here. Um, I'm kind of uh, it's kind of bittersweet to bring up the 2006 championship in this way, in my opinion. Just like yes, we we praise it all the time, but just I I never thought it was going to happen again. Um, and here it is. And now... Uh, I mean, I, I just... The circumstances are more than a little bit different. I mean, I know that it's relatable, but the circumstances are different in my opinion. Very much so. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so with three rounds to go, we still have really no firm... Like, we don't even have two people who are the the title contenders. It's like funny the, because yeah. these last few rounds when Mir you know, took the lead and kept the lead... It's Rens who's been winning. 
That's why it's it's so easy Correct. to overlook Mir too because his teammate alone is is doing all the winning. I mean, I flubbed it in the beginning. That's why do you think that happened? <laughs> Even Franco's now fourth of the championship, and he's been behind. I mean, he's still behind Fabio, but he's catching up. And they and they asked they asked him during the press conference before the race, "Are you going to do team orders?" And he's like, "Team orders, bro. I'm still in it." And then he went and won. Yeah. <laughs> like he's not out. He's completely not out. One mistake, and this is my closing thoughts. Right, is we have four or five guys that are in it, and it is literally going to come down to not whoever wins their main races. It's going to come down to who doesn't fuck up. Well, there's there's two things going for less fuck ups. We're not going to Estoril, and we're not finishing at Valencia. That's true. <laughs> yeah, I guess. I, yeah, I, I mean the, like the, I fi- the final that. round is a free for all for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Portugal will absolutely be a free for all. Um, it's a track that GP I'm pretty sure has never been to before. Uh, the undulations there, the new pavement. I think they're going to stress the bikes out and and the riders in a way that no one is quite expecting. Mm-hmm. Um, there has been testing there, if I'm not mistaken, so the the tires should be able to handle it. Um, and probably uh, Stefan Bradl will probably have a slight head start on everyone else. Not that that will matter whatsoever. <laughs> right, <laughs> well, that won't matter at all. <laughs> but yeah, no, I'm I'm totally looking forward to it. I'm already telling like my friends that are like halfway into GP of like, oh man, you got to check out this Excuse final me. round. I love how Kev froze. For his <laughs> I mean, it's going to go down to the final round. <clears throat> Did I it freeze in my sneeze? Yeah, like, we, like we caught right a little bit. The most yeah. inopportune. <laughs> it's even worse. <laughs> How is he holding it? <laughs> All right, let's get out of here before Kev's internet gets any worse. All right, everyone. Uh, yeah. Thanks for joining us for this quick little uh, sidebar episode. Yeah. Um, we've got this weekend off from pretty much all racing. And, mm-hmm. uh, and then we're jumping into two Valencias and a Portugal. Are we going to record in the middle of those two Valencias or after? I don't know. Back? Before I don't know. and after and during. We got we to gotta invite Bye. Kyle on the show. Maybe get Kyle and Josh Heron to like kiss and make up on the show. And then like, right. uh, who else do we? Who else, people no, are we like, should do that when the Super Chats has reached a certain amount. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to the guy who bought the shirt and under delivery instructions wrote, please deliver a signed autograph of Kyle Wyman, but I want Josh Heron to sign it. No, it was the other oh, way, way around. An autograph oh, picture okay. of Josh Heron, <laughs> but he wanted Kyle Wyman to sign it. Yeah, <laughs> brutal. I uh, apologize to everyone that wanted both Buster hair or a picture of Buster. Um, you didn't get either. You already know that. I don't know. No pearl we'll, hair. Yeah, well, no, no pearl hair. There was like there was one guy a year or two ago that was like, "I am deathly allergic to cats. Please keep my shirt away from cat hair." <laughs> and I'm like, "I got gotcha. you." <laughs> I got you. So yeah, my, and I kept. I also kept. I like. I wore a face mask for the majority of the time of packing those shirts up. So trying nice. to keep everyone safe. Damn. There you go. All right, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us for this uh, episode number one forty. Um, let us know in the comments on YouTube and uh, hit us up with some some messages on what you think that the twenty twenty title means. Um, as you got from me and Kev, we think it means more. Thanks for listening. Peace. And if you don't know what Dennis thinks, he'll respond to you in the comments with what he thinks. Absolutely. Later.